please join me in the study of the revived Roman Empire in the feet of clay. Now, in the delivery of this word, we're going to be looking at what the Most High was indeed revealing to us through the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and what significance that has for us today in the year 2021 and beyond. Because we must make no mistake, the dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar by the Most High. And Nebuchadnezzar couldn't retrieve the dream. He knew that he had the dream. It was disturbing to him. Um, and in fact, Daniel, nor anyone else, was able to um, express to uh, King Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was all about. It was only when Daniel went in prayer to the Most High and asked for the retrieval of the dream to be given back to Nebuchadnezzar that the dream became apparent. And when Daniel was able to go to the king and express what the Most High had um, revealed to Daniel that was in fact the dream that Nebuchadnezzar was able to bear witness that that was in fact what the dream was. And so the dream is prophecy for our time. And we're going to see that in the study. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 tells us that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Hallelujah. Now, that light came to us 2,000 years ago. And yet the light of the truth of Yah's word still shines brightly in the souls of the redeemed of Yah. And I pray that this message and our subsequent study, meaning your independent study that you're going to do uh, beyond this video and my continued study, that our continued study will serve to further clarify and fortify our understanding of true worship. And as we consider the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we're going to see that what it really had to do with was the matter of worship. John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. But a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. Allahim is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. End of quote. Okay, and so... The light of truth, which is the word of our creator and maker, whose name in Hebrew is Yahuwah, revealed himself to us through our Messiah, Yahusha, who some call Jesus. Yahusha came to us with purpose. And that is so as to enable us to worship the Most High in spirit and in truth. Not just in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty now and now. And you know, it's absolutely necessary 
for us to make this point because even though the word says that we are not to hate our brothers and sisters, there are yet some who say that they are Bible believers and yet their religious doctrine is based in hate, pride, and privilege. And there are those who say that they are Bible believers and yet they willfully sin and are quick to say that they're only human. But if that is true, if they are only human, then that means that they still have need of being born again. And in doing so, receiving the forgiveness of sin and receiving the empowering favor of our Prince of Peace and King of Righteousness, so as to be able to walk worthy of his sacrifice. And so as we continue with John uh, chapter 4, verses 23 to 24, we have to remind ourselves that this is a, a passage taken from, from a conversation between Messiah and a Samaritan woman. And the Samaritans were amongst those of the northern kingdom of Israel, which had uh, been dispersed and Hellenized, which means that they had given themselves over to a Greek mindset where they had mixed pagan worship with their worship of the true and living Elohim Yahuwah. Now, since the time of the split between the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel, there had been a disagreement about the place of worship. And in verse 21, Messiah tells the Samaritan woman that the time was coming and has now come that true worshipers would worship in neither physical locality because the fulfillment of the Father's plan would provide for true worship in the spiritual heart of the redeemed. And this was what was being illustrated by the worship that had been commanded in Jerusalem until that time of fulfillment would come to pass. And it's just like the many lambs that were slaughtered as a sacrifice for sin was an illustration of the actual fulfillment that was to come in the Lamb of Yah, who was once and for all made our sacrifice for sin. And we have to be really clear that our hands raised as a, a sign of surrender of our own will is not the actual fulfillment of worship. But instead, it's an illustration of acts of obedience which show forth the true worship. And so the feet of a person illustrates worship as well. However, the feet illustrate a movement in a certain direction or sustained acts of obedience one after another step by step. And so it's an even stronger show of worship. And we want to keep these things in mind as we look at the prophetic significance of the feet and the image revealed to us in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so let us consider the feet of clay in the image seen in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And as we can see, the feet were not just made of clay, but there is a mixing of iron and clay. And the fact that there is mixing 
is significant. That is an important point to, for us to remember, as well as the fact that this mixing is seen in the feet of the image. And there is significance in that fact as well. Now, although we will briefly take a look at the entire image, our focus is on the feet because that's where world history is today. And that is where the present warning is for the body of Messiah. Now, in Daniel chapters 2 and 7, we see lots of imagery. And it is revealed to us that the iron is significant of the Roman Empire. And so we're going to talk about who then does the clay represent that the Roman Empire is depicted to be mixed with. Also, I believe that the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream has much to say about the anti-Messiah and the system of anti-Messiah. And the fact that scripture reveals to us that there shall be many anti-messiahs and that they are religious in appearance and not secular because scripture says that they went out from us to show that they were not of us. But they still bear the appearance of being of us. And so it's really important for us to be able to recognize the departure from the truth. Okay, so let's get started. Well, when it comes to the mixing of the iron and clay being depicted in the feet, we must take that fact in the context of the big picture. Because we know as well that the entire image is revealing spiritual truth to us by means of the use of physical objects. And the use of each specific metal says something about the kingdom that that metal represents. It's also important to note that the head of gold is the kingdom of Babylon. And the name Babylon means mixture or confusion by mixing, which says to us that this gold was not pure gold, but an aloe gold, which is in its natural state and is still mixed with other ma materials which it was drawn from, and the refining process is intended to remove those other materials and bring out purity. That is purity as is brought about by what the Bible calls sanctification, which is our refinement process that begins after being born again. Because at the new birth, we're given the promised land of the mind of Messiah Yahusha. But we yet have to possess the land. We have to walk it out. Now, in the natural, the head of a person also speaks of authority, and the ability to think and decide. And in keeping with this analogy, that means in, in this head of aloe gold, that the thought life is not one that is pure. Now, when we turn our attention to the feet, we know that the feet of a person speaks of their walk 
And in scripture, the way a person walks speaks of their way of life, which is an expression of the accumulation of the daily choices and decisions that were made in their thinking. And so it is no great surprise that there is mixture in the head and the feet of the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In the book of James, we're told that it is our actions which are an expression of what we truly believe. Let's look at that, James chapter 2, verse 18. Someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. End of quote. And so we see the connection between thought and deed, or head and feet. Now, as has been said in a previous study on this channel called The Usual Suspects, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, as presented to us in the image, are not just four world powers which ruled in the order depicted on the image, but most well, specifically, these four empires each took Jerusalem captive. Or in Hebrew, the name of that city would be Yerushalayim. And, and I just want to make a point here that it is very important that we do include in our study the study of the meanings of um, the names of places and people especially in the Hebrew, and looking at the, those actual Hebrew words. Because there's such a depth of understanding that's available to us um, when we include the meaning of names, of places, and people in Scripture. So it's not a matter of culture. It's a matter of revelation. Okay, so um, again, we want to be clear that the four empires each took Jerusalem or Yerushalayim captive. And for the sake of biblical prophecy, that is what we need to be certain that we first understand about this image. This image depicts the captivities of Jerusalem and the religious belief which was a result of those captivities. Most specifically, Babylonian Judaism, which is what the book of Revelations calls the mother of harlots. In that phrase, mother of harlots, we see in Revelation 7, Verse 5. And I know your first thought might be, but this is the image of a male. And you know, that's true. So let's break down that phrase the mother of harlots. Well, first of all, we must be clear that the phrase is referring to a spiritual identity and not a physical woman. The key to understanding the imagery in Hebrew scripture is to consider the functionality of the physical objects that are being used to reveal invisible spiritual characteristics or invisible spiritual principles of truth. And so the word mother speaks of someone who gives birth. And a harlot speaks of someone who is unfaithful 
and involves themselves in intimate relationships, which are usually based on money, although not always. The book of Hosea illustrates the Most High's relationship with Israel, and he speaks of Israel playing the harlot and being unfaithful with the pagan worship that they incorporated in their worship of the Most High. And so the mother of harlots is speaking of one through which this spiritual fornication came to be. And the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is the revelation of who the mother of harlots committed harlotry with, which then produced other harlots. I know, um, I know that a lot has been said about Roman Catholicism being the mother of harlots. But as we can even see depicted in the image, Babylonian Judaism preceded Roman Catholicism. And when we take a closer look at the feet of clay, which we will do in this study, we will see even in the feet of clay, which represents the Roman Empire, that Constantine's Roman Catholicism is actually molded after Babylonian Judaism, which actually champions the natural man and denies the Ruach Kadesh, or Holy Spirit. Now, to be clear, denying the Ruach Kadesh, commonly called the Holy Spirit, is not just something that occurs with the mouth. Denying the Ruach Kadesh also happens when we confess him with our mouths, but deny him in our hearts, our spiritual hearts, with decisions and choices and actions which are contrary to his word. Isaiah 29, 13. Therefore, the Lord said, These people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is but by rules taught by men. End of quote. And so Babylonian Judaism, which came about as a result of the captivities of Jerusalem and is evidenced by the Babylonian Talmud, is the mother of Roman Catholicism and Roman Protestantism, which have both sought to westernize scripture now, does that mean that the truth of the word of the Most High is not going forth in any measure in any church today? Well, of course not. But it does mean that we must humbly reconsider that which we have accepted as doctrinal belief. And that begins with having a clear understanding of the governing power of the Ruach Kadesh, made resident and reigning in a person's soul. And we must be clear about what that really means. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But, you know, I think that there is something that we are missing in understanding this verse because the Spirit of the Lord is everywhere. He is omnipresent, meaning that he is everywhere at the same time. And King David said, if 
I make my bed in hell. You're there. Where can I go to escape your presence? And so clearly, the Most High is everywhere at the same time, and yet not everyone is free. And so in this translation, we must see the truth of this verse expressed in the emphasis on the understanding that the Spirit of the Lord is describing how he is functioning in any given place. So maybe a better way of expressing what is being said to us there is to say, where the Spirit is Lord, there is freedom. Hallelujah. And so it is. Hen, Ushalom Mishpaka, Favor and Peace Family. May the favor of our King continue to empower us to do the will of our Father. Unhindered by the false religious traditions of man. And at the coming of our King, may we be found in true worship of our Father through the image of the Son, our Messiah, Yahusha, formed in us. Please continue with me in the study of the image that illustrates the captivity of Jerusalem and the revived Roman Empire and the feet of clay. <laughs> 